Hello, hello. Thank you so much for tuning in to this soft spoken ASMR video. I just want to start off first by saying thank you so much to those who have liked, commented, and subscribed. It has meant so much to me. I'm sorry it's taken me a little bit to uh, record another video. I had one recorded and then I realized I flipped names around. Um, I didn't feel right posting it when I was using the middle name, not the first name. Anyway, so today we're going to be doing a disappearance case. There was a few reasons this one I really felt like I wanted to talk about. Number one being that these kind of cases need more attention and need to be talked about more. Number two is this is located in Baltimore, where I'm actually from and living near, so it hits close to home. Today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Akia Eggleston. She was born Akia Shanta Eggleston on September 6th, 1994. She was described as being smaller but a firecracker, just like her mother. She was always trying to make other people happy and lighten their day and she absolutely loved to dance. She was close to her stepfather, her mom, her aunt, and her grandparents. And unfortunately, her mother passed from breast cancer years earlier. Her aunt reports that she had a really difficult time with her mother's passing. She really held on to friends as family but her aunt was a little sus about the genuine intentions these friends had. So she actually got an inheritance, inheritance from her mother, which was about $20,000. So despite warnings from her family to keep it on the low key, she did inform her friends of this money. And her aunt kind of says she feels like they were kind of moving in and out and taking advantage of her. She lived in Cherry Hill, Baltimore. At 22 years old, she had a two-year-old daughter who she had the best relationship with. They were always together. They were dancing, playing, singing. They just had this really beautiful mother and daughter relationship. Her family began to grow when she found out she was pregnant with a baby boy. She was very excited about this pregnancy, even though it was a difficult pregnancy because she um, was actually high risk due to the baby being breached. So this caused her to have difficulty walking and getting around. She was directed to be on bed rest, but her family reports that she was still active with her friends and family, and she didn't want to just be sitting around. She kept the identity of the baby's father to herself. Her grandpa in an interview was saying he was just respecting her privacy and was just there to listen for when she wanted to discuss anything. Her aunt says at the time she felt that the father of the baby and her were not in a relationship. It's not till later that the family discovers the identity of the father of the baby. And her stepfather, Sean, actually realizes he knows this guy from childhood. His name was Michael Andre Robinson. And her stepdad, it's like, okay, didn't know you were dating my daughter. So a little background on the relationship. 
with Michael and Akia is that they met when his grandmother babysat her at a young age in the 1990s. The two reconnected in the mid-2016 at the birthday party that they had for a mutual friend and they began dating shortly thereafter. Michael was 35 at the time and he was actually in a relationship with another 22-year-old woman named Haley Pomero. Haley gave birth to her second child with Michael in August of 2016. Akia got pregnant in or around September of 2016. So very close. After being evicted from an apartment he shared with Haley, Michael began staying overnight on a regular basis at Akia's Cherry Hill apartment around April of 2017. On May 1st, 2017, Akia messaged a friend on Facebook stating, Gotta put a deposit down on a new place, renew my permit, and see what's going on with this car if I decide to get it. The friend asked, What new place? And Akia responded, it's a place on Mount Street, going to see it tomorrow to see if I like it, if so I'm going to give a deposit. At 12.42pm on May 2nd, 2017, Michael sent Akia photos of an interior of an apartment slash townhouse through Facebook Messenger, but these photos were blurry, so he resent them through his messages on his phone. On May 2nd, 2017, at approximately 1.24 p.m., Akia purchased two money orders totaling to be $450 from a Royal Farms store in Baltimore using cash obtained through an ATM withdrawal from her savings account. At 1.41 p.m., Akia sent a Facebook message to Michael saying, I called you. I got the money order. Around 3.36 p.m. on May 2nd, 2017, Akia smoked, spoke to a male friend who remembered Akia sounding happy, but advised that although the relationship with Michael was okay, she was unsure about trusting him because he was in a relationship with at least one other woman. Despite this, she seemed excited. Um, she said that, you know, it seemed like the baby's father was going to pay for a house for them to live in and was going to buy them a car for transportation. The friend believed Akia expected the purchase of a rental or a house or a car was going to happen in the near future. Minutes later, at approximately 3.45 p.m., Michael searched, Where can I cash money order in Baltimore, MD? from his Google account. Around 4 p.m. on May 2nd, Wells Fargo Bank Records placed a Kia in the downtown area of Baltimore, where she unsuccessfully attempted to withdraw cash from an ATM. So she tried to do $400 and then $200. At the same time, she was texting back and forth with Michael, but we're not quite sure what the content of these messages are. Based on cellular phone records, Michael was at work during the day on May 2nd. By his calling patterns and his cell data, he left work at his usual time, and he arrived near Akia's home by 4.15 p.m. Through Akia's cell site data, she returned to the area covered by her home cellular tower by 5.17 p.m. At 6.05 p.m., Akia posted a picture of her pregnant belly on Facebook. At 6.06 p.m., one minute after Akia's post, 
Michael and Haley began a series of text messages and Facebook messages back and forth that continued into the early morning hours of May 3rd. So as Haley and Michael exchanged these messages, Ikea was on Facebook Messenger and at 10.32 p.m. was asked by a friend, Hey, did you get to go to the townhouse and drop off the deposit? She then responded immediately, no, I have to go tomorrow. At 10.42 p.m., Michael sent Haley a Facebook message that he was sleeping and just had to lay down and don't do this. At 10.50 p.m., Michael wrote to Haley, please, Haley, I'm going crazy, followed by, please call me. I'm walking over there right now. At 11.58 p.m., Michael wrote, almost at 195, even though his cell site data shows that he never left the cellular tower coverage area near Akia's residence. So, later Michael would suggest that he would walk between Haley and Akia's places. Haley was living with her mother in Elkridge, which is in a bordering county from the city. It's not in the city. It's in Maryland. We go by counties and cities. I feel like no other state, maybe some states do that. According to cell site data and employment records, Michael was at work at his job site in DC around 6.30 a.m. on May 3rd. Wow, he really had to wake up, didn't get much sleep then. He was texting Haley until the early morning hours. At this time, he and Akia exchanged text messages throughout the day, and he spoke to Haley for 11 minutes at 7.32 a.m. On the afternoon of May 3rd, 2017, Akia was seen on a bank surveillance video at approximately 12.52 p.m. She was captured on the camera at the bank in the Inner Harbor, depositing money orders and a paycheck, totaling to be $572.42. She then made a withdrawal of $450 in cash. According to the bank employee, Akia told the bank employee that she knew um, that she needed to get cash because the property manager only takes cash. This is really weird because no landlord or property manager is going to ask for cash of like a, a security deposit when it's in Baltimore and you just don't really do that because you might get robbed. Um, Also during the afternoon of May 3rd, 2017, Akia's Facebook account exchanged messages about her plans regarding the new apartment with several friends. In some of these messages, she indicated that she was moving to Mount Street and that she was going to get the keys today. She also had told someone that they were going to be living together in this new place and that they had been living together for a while, but it's on the on the hush. So another friend then asked, so is he going to be actually there for everything, like the baby shower and all? To which Akia responded, yep. On May 3rd, 2017, at approximately 3.45 p.m., a Lyft driver picked up an individual later identified by the driver as Michael off of I-97. This ride was actually requested by a Lyft user of a Kia Eggleston. The location is a short distance from his place of employment at the time, which was located in Glen Burnie, to her residence. I think it was like 10 miles, something like that. 
I'm acting like I'm ways right now, like I know. At approximately 4 p.m., the Lyft driver dropped off Andre off one of the buildings, a building over from her residence in Cherry Hill. Analysis of call detail records indicates that Akia's phone was at or near her residence between 3.05 p.m. and 4.05 p.m. on May 3rd. Those records further indicate that at 3.43 p.m., a short time after Akia booked that Lyft, ri Lyft ride, her cell phone received an call incoming call from Lyft, which then proceeded to her calling Michael for 50 seconds. This was the last contact between their phones on May 3rd. So then Michael's next phone call occurred at 5.34 p.m. And at this time, his phone was then binged to be close to her residence. Based on the call records and lift records, the investigators conclude that Akia and Michael were together at her Cherry Hill residence during the late afternoon hours of May 3rd. At approximately 5.22 p.m., Akia sent her friends an invite to her baby shower, which was scheduled for Sunday, May 7th, 2017. This Facebook message is the last known outgoing communication sent by Akia to anyone. An analysis of Michael's cell phone records on May 3rd indicates his phone was in the area near Akia's residence when he made and received phone calls from 5.53 p.m. to 6.18 p.m. Michael and Haley called each other four times between about 5.35 p.m. and 5.40 p.m. There's no contact between the two again until 6.05 p.m. So this means that there's a notable two gaps in Akia and Michael's cell phone and social media activity around this time. The first gap is approximately 13 minutes, and this is between Akia's last outgoing message at 5.22 p.m. until 5.35 p.m. when Michael calls Haley. The second gap is approximately 26 minutes, and that's between the two calls from Michael to Haley, the first being at 5.39 p.m. and the second at 6.05 p.m. At 6.16 p.m., Michael calls his brother. At 6.18 p.m., Haley called Michael, and the two spoke for over eight minutes. Sorry, there's a lot of times in this, but it's important just to get the timeline. At 6.22 p.m., Michael's phone begins to move away from the area around Akia's apartment in Cherry Hill towards downtown Baltimore as he continues to communicate with Haley. So there's no phone calls, no location data from... Kia's phone between 4.05 p.m. and 6.57 p.m. At 6.51 p.m., Michael's phone was located in the area of East Lombard Street and South Howard Street in downtown Baltimore. According to call detail records, the last activity on a Kia's phone was an unanswered possible telemarketer incoming call at 6.57 p.m. At that time, Akia's phone was located in the same area in downtown Baltimore as Michael's. After that incoming call, all activity ceased on Akia's phone, which indicates that her phone was disabled or turned off after that time. Shortly after 7 p.m., Michael visited his brother and his home on the block of Wilkins Avenue. Michael's brother was interviewed most recently on November 9th of 2021, and he recalled a few things unusual 
about this visit. On this occasion, Michael brought a 40-ounce beer with him, which he could rarely afford to do. He also did not ask for anything to eat during the visit, which was usually the primary reason that he went to his brother's home. After a couple video games on the Xbox, Michael left. Akia was not with him during this visit, even though her cell phone records indicate she was. According to records provided by Sprint, Michael changed his phone number on May 6, 2017 at 11.33 a.m., which was a full 24 hours prior to that baby shower I told, told you about earlier on that Sunday. So her baby shower again was scheduled for May 7th from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. She was eight months pregnant at this time. She had actually planned her own baby shower, sent out electronic visit or invites, and she put down a $900 deposit for this baby shower, which is a lot of money. She told friends and family members that Michael was going to be in attendance and that he was going to be bringing food. As family and family members, friends and family members arrive at the baby shower, they notice that Ikea did not arrive, and neither did Michael. At approximately 2 p.m., when Ikea failed to show, family members and friends drove to her residence in Cherry Hill looking for her. They began calling her cell phone, but her phone went directly to voicemail. Family members and friends then searched the surrounding area of the residence, but there was no sign of her. A call was then placed to the police department, and she was reported officially missing. Remember again, she's eight months pregnant, and she's high-risk pregnancy as well. So the missing person unit detectives responded to Akia's residence on May 9th. They did not find any signals of forced entry into the apartment. Family members told the detectives that certain items were missing, including clothing, a dresser, but then there were some items left behind. It just looked like half-ass moving. It was weird. Um, there was also a, a hole in the drywall upstairs outside of her bedroom, but it kind of looked like it was consistent with someone carrying uh, like jockeying out the dresser from the hallway like down to the stairs. So her apartment was located on the end unit and there's actually rear doors on these apartments. So it was it's pretty normal in Baltimore. I don't know if any other places, but there'll be buildings and they'll actually be back doors of those buildings and then a little strip of grass in between the buildings in the back. So since hers were on the end, since her apartment was the end unit, she was right by the parking lots and the dumpster. The detective states that he believes that furniture was moved out around this time that the events occurred. He also goes on to say that he believes there might be a possible way to carry out larger items from this end unit into the dumpsters. Her family is shocked by these things that have been moved out of her place. She could barely walk, so there's no way she's moving this furniture on her own. And it's just suspicious that no one came forward and said, Hey, yeah, I was the one who helped her move for a little bit. 
we carried some items or I carried some items out or no one came forward to say that, but there's no way she would have been able to do this on her own. Her aunt also states that when she came into the apartment, she noticed that there was a mop and a bucket at the end of the stairs. So Michael has been interviewed multiple times in the course of this investigation, but he has displayed a consistent pattern of hiding and avoiding police contact for weeks or months at a time in between interviews. His first interview was through telephone on May, May of 2017. And then despite numerous attempts to locate him, Michael was unable to be interviewed by police again until June 15th. Following that interview, he couldn't be located again until October. And then within days of being interviewed in October, Michael, Haley, and their two small children moved to Michigan, where several of Haley's residents reside. Interviews were conducted with Haley's friends and family in Michigan, who indicate that when Michael arrived to Michigan, he did not want to obtain employment or any form of identification. So Michael essentially claims that he last saw a Kia on the Monday morning before the scheduled baby shower. I believe this would have been May 1st. So he's saying that he last saw her May 1st. He then states that on Monday, he came and went to work, and then he came back, and all his shit was packed for him. Then he took the hint and said, okay, I'll get my shit and roll. He tried to call and talk to her, but she didn't answer, so he left. He knocked on her door. He was kind of going back and forth, and then eventually she just said, I'm all right, and laid back down and went to sleep, and he said that's the last time he saw her. So then he kind of says, like, he, um, because the investigators are like, hey, like, did you go over later that afternoon? And he says, I talked to her the night before and I let her know that, you know, um, I'm going to be coming back. But then he never heard a response. Um, so he's like texting her and, and doing all this stuff. And he says he's getting the hint and just grabs his stuff and leaves again. So during, um, June 2017 interview, he was asked to provide the phone number that he had at the time that he last saw Akia. He then provided detectives with an incorrect phone number. He was also asked about if they were going to be moving into that apartment on Mount Street, to which he responded, we weren't planning to rent a place up on Mount Street. Michael was interviewed again on October 19th, 2017. This time, he was confronted with those photos of the apartment he sent to her on Facebook. He admitted that he sent them, but reports that they never visited an apartment. So investigators actually take the photos sent, and they do a reverse Google image search and locate this apartment of the actual place that the photographs that he sent to her. This resident was a completely different resident. Um, the owners were actually interviewed in 2020 and they stated they had no record of ever being contacted by Michael or Akia. The property was located across town on the east side of Baltimore, and it was listed for $28.75 a month with a deposit of $28.75. So that's way higher than a $900 deposit that IKEA believed that she was providing 
when she was depositing all the money. Um, they then ask him why he changed his phone number around the time of her disappearance. So remember, he um, changed his number according to Sprint. He replied that he was receiving threatening phone calls and death threats from Akia's relatives accusing him for being responsible. But this is very strange because he changed his phone number Saturday, May 6th, and that was a day before the May 7th baby shower where she was actually reported missing. So in an interview on October 4th, 2021, Haley told investigators that she and Michael stayed in a hotel together in Lithicum the weekend of the baby shower. Haley also confirmed getting into an argument with him the night of May 2nd about Akia's photograph posted on Facebook. So then a Google account linked to Michael was identified and records obtained via a search warrant show that his account was created in 2010 and it was registered to the Mortician. A review of Google search history revealed 18 distinctive searches. This included trash, pickup, landfills, and dumpster pickup in Baltimore City. Specifically, these were conducted on the day for where does Baltimore City trash get, go, and picked up? Baltimore City dumpster pickup and Baltimore City landfill. Detectives do look into um, dumpsters the dumpsters in that area and they see that the dumpsters are picked up several times a week and transported to a landfill located in northern Virginia. They visited the landfill and spoke with engineers who determined the area of the landfill where the trash was deposited consisted of two 10-acre sections. So, this area would have gotten like about 500,000 tons of solid waste from the time that the trash would have been put into the landfill and when they were beginning to look into the dumpsters. So this would have accumulated to 50 feet deep of trash within a few weeks of her disappearance. Right now there are no heavy equipment currently available to reach farther than 20 feet down and due to safety regulations because of hazard gases they aren't able to dig more than four feet down. So investigators have interviewed over a hundred people regarding this case. They even offered a $25,000 reward for anyone with information. This was much higher than the average two to $3,000 reward Baltimore will give out. In May 2021, the police department asks again, for help locating Akia. They say that they've invested more than a thousand man hours into this case. On February 3rd, 2022, Michael is arrested for the murder of Akia. He is charged with two counts of first degree murder in the killing of Akia and her unborn child. He faces a maximum penalty of two life sentences in prison if found guilty. The state's attorney office released a full statement which states that based on the pattern of her life, the time passed, 
multiple searches and the monetary reward for the information in this case, the fact that Akia has not returned to her family or has been electronically or physically located overwhelmingly indicates that she in fact is deceased. And through interviews, financial records, telephone records, social media communication, the only real person with motive, means, and opportunity to murder her was the father of her unborn child, Michael Robertson. Her father, Sean Wilkinson, never gave up putting attention on this case and shedding light on this case. She disappeared in 2017 and they never got any arrests or closures until up till recently of 2022. Between those years, her father was just on it. He even testified before the U.S. House lawmakers about the disappearance of his daughter. He went into the U.S. House Oversight Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties to focus on a hearing about the lack of attention to missing black, Hispanic, an indigenous woman. So, in 2020, the U.S. Census reports that 40% of women and girls reported missing were of color. This is despite the makeup of only 16% of the population. So her father goes on to say the epidemic of missing persons of colors is not a new topic, but one that has been dismissed because society does not care about us. Missing black people remain missing four times longer than white people. So sadly, Akia's body has never been located but it is strongly believed her remains may be in the landfill. So this is the very sad disappearance case of Akia Eggleston. This one has a little bit more of closure for the family, I hope, but it's just devastating. You know, I think shedding light on these cases is really important because I think it's true, there is not enough attention on black, Hispanic, and indigenous people missing. And this case, you know, it's an eight month pregnant mother. She also had a two year old daughter. And, you know, I think when we think of a murdered, pregnant woman, we all think of the same person, but we don't know about these cases. So I just wanted to shed some light on this case. I saw I got a request for a case, and I do intend on doing that, so thank you so much for this suggestion. I just wanted to watch, there's a documentary that goes with it. And I wanted to find the time to watch it because I think it helps. I try to watch videos of interviews of people involved in the case directly. So I just want to find the time to watch that. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that you're having a good day or night. And I hope you have a good day tomorrow.